Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NYU Game Center guest lecture series. Uh, I am Frank, uh, Frank Lance, the director of the NYU Game Center, and um, tonight uh, we are going to hear from uh, Alex Galloway. Um, and um, I just a quick announcement. Uh, as always, the uh, the lecture series is is uh, supported by a generous grant from the Rockefeller Cultural Innovation Foundation and by other anonymous donors. So we thank them for letting this take place, uh, and thank you all for for showing up tonight. Um, Alex is a, a professor here at NYU in the Media Education and Culture. Uh, I'm sorry, Media uh, Culture and Communication uh, Department, and uh, he's also a, a founding member of the uh, kind of artist software group, RSG, um, and he has uh, written several books, uh, Protocol, How Control Exists After Decentralization, Gaming, Essays on Algorithmic Culture, and um, uh, also The Exploit, A Theory of Networks. So um, I've uh, always been interested in, in uh, Alex's uh, work and thought, and I uh, was interested in having him come here and explore this particular issue. I wanted to hear uh, his take on the relationship between uh, philosophy and games, which is something I think is uh, a really fascinating topic and uh, kind of uh, underexplored. So uh, without further ado, Alex Galloway. Thank you. All right. Okay, great. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I think this is going to be fun. Um, I want to uh, basically give you a kind of overview today of the way in which games and play, the concept of play, have figured um, in the work of Western philosophy. So um, we'll be covering a lot of territory. Um, the only disclaimer is, uh, that I'll offer you is that um, I am not a philosopher. Uh, but I'll, I'll, tr I'll try my best um, to give you a kind of um, sort of uh, snapshot of the ways in which uh, games and play have, have connected with, with the history of philosophy. Uh, and the goal here is to have fun and not be boring. Okay, <laughs> so it's usually customary to start um, not so much with talking about philosophy and games or even philosophy of games, but to start instead with a kind of set of descriptions about what makes a game. And those of you who've studied games are probably familiar with um, these kinds of writings. French uh, sociologist and anthropologist Roger Calois, for example, writes that games are make-believe, that they are accompanied by a special awareness of a second reality or of a free unreality as against real life. The Dutch cultural historian Johan Housinga agrees, writing that play transpires quite consciously outside ordinary life. Or consider something like uh, Bernard Suits, the author of an important 1967 essay called What is a Game, in which he talks about games as, quote, the voluntary effort to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Play is a voluntary activity, writes Housinga, executed within certain fixed limits of time and place, according to rules freely accepted but absolutely binding, having its aim in itself and accompanied by a feeling of tension, joy, and the consciousness that it is different from ordinary life. Or, as Bernard Suits puts it in a, in a slightly simpler form, games require a lucery attitude. Now, for the Greeks, there were several different kinds of play or games, several different windows into this complex concept. And this is a famous early image of, of Achilles playing Ajax at some kind of um, game of drafts. Uh, we can think about sport, um, a aspect of Greek life that was highly regarded. Think also about uh, play as what uh, the poet does, what the musician does, what the tragedian does. 
Again, this was also highly regarded, considered in fact to be divine. One must be inspired by the muses, after all. But play is also um, associated with um, not just sport or what, what poets and musicians do, but also with learning, which is a sense of play that we, we still have today. Um, and in fact, this term pedia, which Calois um, uses in his book, is a Greek word that means play, but it really also means um, childishness and infancy. Not childishness in a kind of, um, a kind of patronizing way, but, but simply that, that kind of thing that an infant does when they're playing with blocks, right? Um, this is what Kelwa calls a frolicsome and impulsive exuberance. And this word, um, pedia, is very, very similar to the Greek word, um, which is the general word for education or cultivation, which is paideia. So these two concepts, I think, and even today we can understand why they might be related. A child is playing and learning and, and the childishness is all kind of wrapped up together. So typically play has been um, understood in games as well between these two, these two different ends. The, the end of a kind of free, whimsical, um, you know, sense of sort of playing around with things as opposed to a more rule-bound structure. Or again, what Kelwa calls um, paedia on one side and ludus on the other side. Now, in Plato, um, he, I'll give you sort of two different references here in Plato. Um, for example, when he talks about children, he uses the concept of play in, as it were, a sort of normatively good sense as education or some kind of um, mimesis that can help in learning. So this is from the laws. Anyone who would be good at anything must practice that thing from his youth upwards, both in sport and earnest. For example, he who is to be a good builder should play at building children's houses. And those who have the care of their education should provide them, when young, with mimic tools, basically with, with play tools. However, those of you who know the old chestnut uh, from Plato about how he you know, wanted to kick the poets out of the Republic, uh, you know that, that play is also, um, as mere imitation, Play can never really be held in, in the utmost esteem for Plato. So I'll read a passage here from the Republic. The imitator has no knowledge worth mentioning of what he imitates. Imitation is only a kind of play or sport. And the tragic poets, whether they write in iambic or in heroic verse, are imitators in the highest degree. So you have both of these, both of these things um, in, in, in the classical tradition. OK. Now, um, moving <laughs> very rapidly to the modern area, era, um, we'll be covering a lot of ground tonight. Uh, I want to just <laughs> extremely briefly describe a few different figures in, in, the, in the modern, early modern period that sort of sketch out, a, if you will, a kind of constellation of influences that help uh, inform our contemporary cybernetic, which is to say game-like, maybe game-based environment. So much of our daily lives have, have come to resemble a, a game space. So, quote, if I were to choose a patron saint for cybernetics out of the history of science, I should have to choose Leibniz wrote Norbert Wiener, the MIT mathematician and defense researcher. And indeed, from the early modern period, philosophers like Leibniz and also Spinoza articulate prototypical approximations of game worlds. Leibniz, with his famous 
monadology describes a smooth, universal network of monads, each of which is singular, but also contains within it a mirror of the totality. So there's a kind of, this might be a stretch, but a kind of object-oriented logic here. Also in the ethics of Spinoza, um, there is uh, this notion of a, a universal homogeneous substance at the root of nature from whose infinite attributes emerge things like thought, what we do in our minds, and extension, what our bodies are. And some have likened Spinoza's substance to, again, a kind of distributed network of relations and counter-relations, which is a theory further developed by the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze in the middle-late 20th century. Also in the 20th century, um, inheriting a lot of these ideas, is another figure that maybe isn't read quite as often, um, Ludwig von Bertalanffy with his science of general systems theory. And this is something that I think can be read um, along with, with the work on cybernetics from Wiener and other related sciences um, that all kind of form in the middle 20th century. Because uh, people like, like Berdolanfi help to describe this concept of, of a system, right? An open versus a closed system, how subsystems are nested within systems, right? A system is always merely a subsystem of another, of another system. And as well, how communication and control pass from one part of a system to another. And I think you'll agree that these are all basic concepts today in how games are designed, certainly, and also how um, even at a lower level, how programming languages are designed and how programming languages are able to model games and play within these rather rigid computer algorithms. So again, I'm not trying to you know, say that you know, Leibniz was a gamer or something, but merely to, to sketch what, what a possible historical genealogy might be for um, this game-like world that we live in today. So, in general, I think we could say that philosophers like games for two basic reasons. The first is that philosophers are interested in play. Philosophers are interested in chance, in contingency, in unpredictability, in poetry, in innocence. But philosophers are also obsessed with rules. Um, and much of philosophy is almost a kind of mathematics, right? The, the, the positing of precise formal systems um, that are well-defined and therefore kind of rule-bound. Um, and there's lots of things we could mention. In this context, I'll just mention uh, maybe a famous example, which is um, the example of David Hume and his, his kind of gloss on the, relation, on the relationship between events and rules. So Hume wrote, uh, among other things, on the problem of induction, right? How, can you determine a rule based on the things that you see happening in the world, right? So if you see 10 white swans, do you know as a rule that the 11th white swan, that the 11th swan will be white, okay? Problem of induction, in, inducing the 11th, the color of the 11th swan. And of course, famously, Hume argued that this was not possible. It was not possible to generalize and jump through this inductive process from events, from mere events, to general rules. So during the Enlightenment, games and play, however, take on a slightly new role. And I'm going to be using the work of, of Schiller here as sort of emblematic of this, this tr transformation that I think in, in many ways we're still living through now. So instead of being a, a, a kind of quality of the infant or a mark of childishness, and I don't mean that again in a derogatory sense, um, 
Here now, it takes on a more, if you will, a kind of more elevated uh, nobility. Play now becomes an irreducible, heterogeneous, unquantifiable, absolutely qualitative human endeavor. And the best example here is this concept of, of play drive, which is uh, the concept that um, Schiller puts forward in his famous set of letters on the aesthetic education of man, which comes right after the French Revolution, in fact, and it, it's, it's kind of a good illustration of, of the way in which a lot of these romantic tendencies are also uh, reactionary at a certain level. So the play drive, uh, the play drive is a kind of pure moment and a very necessary moment, Schiller would, would argue, uh, for the continued education of man beyond the, the phase of childhood. But it's a kind of cultivation or eleva- uh, uh, kind of education that is entirely outside of formal and abstract um, constraints, outside um, the kind of human drives that lead to the creation of things like societies. And so, as I said a minute ago, I think that a figure like Schiller is very important um, for somebody like, like Hausinger and the, this, per, this contemporary um, sense of play and games that we have today as being a kind of special bounded place that, that you go to and, and it can kind of give you a sort of poetic, um, I don't know, release of some kind. So both of these figures, um, Schiller and, and, and Housing in the 20th century, consider play to be external, necessarily external to any kind of material gain, right? It's not sullied by material gain. Um, and certainly those moments when, when it is, uh, well, maybe that's not play anymore, right? Maybe that's sport or something like that. Okay, and I, I should I especially thank the designer of this poster because it's it's fantastic. This is this was we used for to advertise this event. Um, so perhaps ironically or serendipitously, this is also e- echoed in a figure like Nietzsche, who has very little to do with um, the kind of philosophical lineage that we would associate with somebody like Schiller. Um, <clears throat> so a figure like Nietzsche who champions um, Dionysus, right? The, the god of free exuberance, of wine drinking, of unbounded play. And Nietzsche, like Deleuze after him, was certainly not unnerved by what he saw as the, the absolute contingency of events, right? This is the big kind of anxiety for many modern philosophers. What do we do? you know, after the death of God, as, as it were, um, when contingency is right in our face. For Nietzsche, this was not scary to him. Uh, this was thrilling, right? This was part of this Dionysian release of play. Um, and he returned to the image offered by the ancients, particularly in, in Heraclitus, this notion that um, Time, right, the god of time is a dice thrower, right? Time as dice thrower. And this is um, something that Deleuze would also echo in his work in the late 1960s, where in in 68 he writes that being itself, ontology itself, was a throw of the dice. Now, you might think, like, well, that's kind of, you know, ridiculous. Um, And Deleuze was not saying this in a kind of pessimistic or cynical gesture, uh, right? It's not a notion that life is a crapshoot. In fact, Deleuze's throw of the dice meant that life was infinitely generative. Think of a, a random number generator, right? So what if being itself was a kind of random number generator um, of pure creativity. Um, and I like to think of uh, 
you know, like a respawn point or something. Uh, you know, this, this kind of never-ending spot that you can always rely on to be generative of new, um, new monsters. Okay. Now, um, we would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Jacques Derrida uh, in his famous essay, Structure, Sign, and Play. And uh, in this essay, he focuses on the concept of play, writing about how things come into play. He talks about the play of the world. And I think we can, we can, we can say here that play, maybe like Deleuze, is sort of how things transpire. How, in a very general way, things happen to happen. So I'll read... Um, Two sentences here uh, from Derrida. Play is the disruption of presence, Nietzschean affirmation, the joyous affirmation of the world in play and of the innocence in becoming, the affirmation of a world of signs without fault, without truth, and without origin, which is offered to an active interpretation. So for Schiller, the play drive was a way to respond to, as I said, these kinds of revolutionary um, uh, spirits in the air, um, something which he viewed as a threat, as a kind of crisis. And certainly in very different ways, figures like Nietzsche and Derrida also posit games as a way of thinking through this, uh, you want to say, a kind of crisis of modernity. Now, in a similar vein, um, or maybe with a similar sense of, of, of kind of uh, responding to the crisis, um, we have another ma major, major reference point, which is the work of um, Wittgenstein. And certainly, if you, if you ask a philosopher about games, the first thing they'll say is, oh, Wittgenstein, language games. So... In, um, in, his, in his later work, Wittgenstein began to write about um, this idea of language games. And he was driven, you might say, by a kind of critical skepticism or a skepticism around um, the, the highly rule-bound way of doing philosophy. And he showed how the use of um, ordinary language and thus the, the actual medium that philosophy uses, right? You, you, you speak it and you write it. That ordinary language was merely a kind of game. A game involving formal rules of meaning and usage. And as such, um, these kinds of games, language games, cannot be right or wrong. Right? The, which would be a thorn in the side of a philosopher. They can simply be applied. They can be played with. So this is another important reference point here, this idea of language games. And I think we could say that this work uh, from Wittgenstein helped usher in, um, well, it certainly helped usher, usher in the so-called linguistic turn in philosophy, which was a moment when philosophy began, began to be much more obsessed with language and the conditions of language. Uh, but even more generally, um, Wittgenstein would later influence the work of uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard and his work on um, theories of postmodernity, the postmodern break that comes a few decades later. Okay. So, again, this tradition around um, kind of play, uh, the, the more sort of whimsical, chance-oriented... Um, unstructured quality of play. But now I'm going to give a, a slightly different lineage which looks at the way in which games and play can be highly structured. So I'm going to take what might seem like a little bit of a detour here, um, but I think it's very crucial to, to uh, in order to um, define um, the, the present situation through two important scientific innovations in the, in the 20th century which are uh, game theory and the theory of cellular automata. Uh, 
And these both get developed kind of in the middle, early, middle 20th century. So I'm going to take a little bit of a step back here. So in 1922, through what he called a numeric process, the English mathematician Lewis Richardson, and, I, and you should really see how this, you know, so we have the landscape as chessboard. Here we have the landscape as chessboard. The mathematician Lewis Richardson proposed a massive chess game to span the continents. A system to predict weather using a cellular space of distributed meteorological sensors. So at the center of every one of these boxes, there'd be a, a weather station. It's recording temperature, pressure. And he called this a lattice, which is a word we, we use a lot now, but at the time he was borrowing a very sexy word from a very sexy new field, uh, the field of crystallography. And in a manner similar to that of um, John von Neumann, who knew of Richardson's work, the organization of spatial cells here become quite literally a technique for computation. So that what you're seeing here is actually a, a, a parallel processing computer that's the size of the globe. The landscape becomes, if you will, a kind of giant chessboard, a, a giant kind of computational game. And if you read Richardson, his language is that of, uh, it's very rich language. It's the language of complex and nonlinear systems, which he borrows from, from thermodynamics. It's the language of eddy movements, of laminar stresses, of air viscosity, of turbulence, of heat flows and connectivity. He discusses the complexity of interactions between layers, atmospheric layers, and the turbulence that results. And then, you like this, with a, with, with a little bit of a, a wink, he adds a little rhyme to help remember it all. Big whirls have little whirls that feed on their velocity, and little whirls have lesser whirls, and so on to viscosity. So, again, we're seeing here, um, and, I, and I hope it's not too much of a stretch to say uh, that this is really a, a parallel processing computer, uh, and it's maybe all the more interesting in that it's arranged as a kind of, um, in Richardson's own words, a kind of massive continental chess game. Now, John von Neumann, um, who, as you know, is instrumental in the creation of um, one of the early um, digital computers that also was one of the first machines to adopt um, random access me memory. Um, von Neumann copied Richardson's chess landscape in this image here, um, in his writings on weather prediction. And in a 1947 um, influential paper, which he co-wrote with uh, Herman Goldstein, called Planning and Coding Problems, which is what this image is, is from, um, super important paper in the development of basically uh, what we know of now as software programming. Um, in this paper they show how computer programming can also benefit from migrating away from a kind of linear organization toward a model of parallel and cellular flows. So it's really the, the derivation of this cellular model. Here you see it not as a rigid chessboard, but as a, a, a kind of flow, flow chart. It's really a derivation of this that I think it's crucial to understand how you know, we have moved into this kind of game, this philosophy of, of a game space. Um, and this leads to what um, Arthur Burks, who was the, one of the people who put together Neumann's papers after he, um, after he passed away, this is what he calls von Neumann's cellular space. And now you see the chessboard um, really formalized into a rigid um, space here. Um, and von Neumann called this cellular space, he quite literally he called it, a, a, you know, his cellular automata for him were computers. It was a way of doing computing um, in a parallel manner, 
Okay, so what we call game theory today, and I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about game theory, but it comes largely from this 1944 book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, written by von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern. Um, and I'm not trying to suggest that game theory, cellular automata, and the digital computer are all the same thing, but I think that there's a case to be made that you know, there's a lot of similarities going on here. Um, so as, as you probably know, game theory um, tries to mathematically model strategic decision making. And it's used often in um, economic modeling. And it uses the same kinds of cellular and flow diagrams that are evident in von Neumann's other work um, during this period in the 40s and 50s, whether it's the modeling of how software flow should happen or um, this, the system of cellular automata. Okay, and now here's a, a special little treat for you, or maybe it's only going to be cool for me, but uh, this is a guy I'm researching right now, um, a total nut job. Uh, he, he, he wrote his dissertation, and it was 500 pages long, and he turned it in, and his committee said, you know, your dissertation is 500 pages long, you have to cut it down, this is ridiculous, and he said, no, and walked away. <laughs> never got his dissertation, never got his PhD. Um, so in 1953, um, Neil Sparicelli went to Princeton to use von Neumann's new digital computer that was just being developed to perform the world's first mathematical modeling of evolution. A kind of primitive artificial life game in which numbers stood for genes and these genes could combine into organisms and then the organisms could evolve and infect each other and evolve over time. And this would be the topic of a whole other talk, but basically one pixel equals one number equals a gene. And whenever you see a consistent shape or a consistent um, swatch of color, um, that is a, an organism. Each um, successive generation going from top to bottom is meant to be a parent-child evolutionary generation, right? Parent, child, 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 next child. Um, and so this illustrates sort of through time from top to bottom the, the transfection of these different organisms. And you can see that there's periods of stability and periods of chaos and so on. This is my contemporary recreation. Um, this is from 1953. But it's, I'm using the same, the same principles. Okay. Now, this may look familiar to you because this is the same thing that gets used in something like Conway's Game of Life. So again, I'm trying to make a connection here between cellular automata as, as really a kind of philosophical, um, you know, kind of shift or invention, even though it's usually thought of as a more kind of technical thing. Um, I'm trying to show how that you know, is really um, an important step in the creation of a kind of game space um, shown here in Conway's Game of Life. And of course this would eventually lead to the, the cellular automata rules that are documented in um, Stephen Wolfram's more recent 2002 book called A New Kind of Science, um, which Maybe new, but it's um, still 49 years after Baricelli did the same thing. Okay. Um, so, Buckminster Fuller, um, I gave game theory, uh, I didn't give it enough time. Uh, I'll, I'll give Fuller's um, criticism of game theory more time. Uh, he articulated some of these same concerns around game theory, around decision making, how we can use game systems. To, to, to model you know, how governments work and so on. In his uh, famous world game and his world design initiative of the 1960s. Now the world game was to be played on a massive, what he called a stretched out football size world map. Football field size world map. The game map was, quote, 
wired throughout so that many bulbs installed all over its surface could be lighted by the computer at appropriate points to show various accurately positioned proportional data regarding world conditions, events, and resources. So that's a mouthful, but the game, Fuller, Fuller's game, was really a kind of global resource management simulation, right? I mean, we play these kinds of games all the time today. Um, think of this game. Okay, but Fuller was, as I hinted a second ago, no fan at all of von Neumann and game theory, and I'll read another quote to illustrate it. In playing the game, his game, um, I propose that we set up a different system of games from that of Dr. John von Neumann, whose theory of games was always predicated on one side losing 100%. His game theory is called Drop Dead. <laughs> In our world game, we propose to explore and test by assimilated adoption various schemes of how to make the world work. To win the world game, everybody must be made physically successful. Everybody must win. Okay. Very, very good uh, altruistic philosophy there. Um, okay, so again, apologies for the whirlwind tour here, but, but we, will, we will make another dramatic um, deviation because it would be um, difficult to talk about the relationship between philosophy and games without talking about um, the history of art art making. Um, I won't go into this in much detail, but I want to at least pay lip service to um, right, the tradition of surrealism, of Dada, um, Fluxus, right, the Fluxus games. Um, and certainly, as we know, um, Marcel Duchamp was an avid, avid chess player. I think he actually played um, on, on, uh, up on um, 10th Street, is it? Uh, there's a little game, a chess club. Um, so I'll, I'll just um, give a little detail here about uh, the Situationist International and uh, remind you of the way in which the Situationist International was very interested in this idea of play and games. And it's interesting, they quote um, Housinga, which is really bizarre because they have totally incompatible politics, but they, they, they do quote the SI quotes him on a number of occasions. So think about the, the situationist, um, which are really philosophical concepts as much as they are kind of concepts for art making. Think about the idea of the derive, this idea of drifting. right? Or think about the idea of um, the concept of a psychogeography, right? being able to kind of create a sort of personal inductive geography that's not bound by, you know, the constraints of a sort of abstract, top-down cartography. Okay, so um, in a project that's very interesting to me personally, uh, I want to mention this, 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 this project here um, from January 1977. Now, Guy Debord did something in, in, in that year that I, I don't think any philosopher has ever done, and I'm probably wrong. But, um, which is that he founded a game company. <laughs> um, a game company, uh, it was called Strategic and Historical Games. Um, Co-founded it with his publisher, actually, because he didn't have the money to do it himself. Uh, and he founded this, this game company with the um, singular aim to produce this game that he had just invented, which is called the Game of War, and he also called it the Kriegspiel. Uh, Kriegspiel being the, the German term for war gaming or a war game. So De Bord's Game of War is a, a kind of chess-like game that tries to model a kind of Napoleonic um, campaign warfare. And it is played by two opposing players on a game board that is 500 squares um, arranged in rows of 20 by 25 squares. So it's bigger than a chessboard. And he said, the surprises of this game seem to be inexhaustible. 
It might be the only thing in all my work I'm afraid to admit that one might dare say has some value. <laughs> um, okay, so the last thing I'll mention, because um, I want to make sure we have time um, to, to have a little bit of discussion here with Frank and Q&A. I'm going to skip over some stuff. Um, there's, there's a great little exchange uh, around the IBM uh, Deep Blue um, Kasparov games that, uh, that Baudrillard famously writes about. Um, there's a whole tradition in Baudrillard about games and play, but we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, again, it, it, you can think of it in this larger tradition of French 60s and 70s philosophy like, like de Borde and Deleuze. Um, so just to end, and I, I don't have anything prepared for this, but um, you know, Frank originally suggested that this talk be a, almost a kind of like real hands-on teach-in to describe some of these new trends that are happening right now in philosophical research and writing. Um, and they go by different names, but um, speculative realism is one of the names. And uh, even more recently, um, object-oriented philosophy or object-oriented ontology um, is another one of these names. So I'll just say maybe one or two sentences about each and then, and then we can have a little conversation. Um, this is a poster for an event that's coming up at Georgia Tech featuring a lot of the figures in this movement. But um, the idea behind speculative realism is that it is a realism. That's the most dramatic aspect of it. Um, which is to say, uh, these people believe in the existence of a real world, <laughs> and they believe that we can say things about it. Now, you might say, well, of course, who cares? We do that all the time. Um, but philosophy has been kind of building up this, this massive sort of um, ideology that says that, that's, that, that, can't, that that can't be done. Um, that, in fact, anything we can say about the world is is really about our perceptions of the world, and it's uh, you know, influenced by our, the social construction that has you know, created the specific ideological form that you know, we're living within, and so on, right? So the speculative realist movement is an attempt to basically cut through that and say, no. We can make direct claims about the world, and the speculative part just means we're going for broke. We're going to try to do, um, you know, very um, ambitious, uh, expansive philosophies that deal with everything from being all the way down. Okay. Object-oriented philosophy is something that's a kind of connected kind of spin-off of that, which um, is still really being developed. And I'm not really sure I buy it. But um, it really kind of, with the help of um, Ian Bogost, I'm sure is a friend of, friend of the center, uh, Maybe he's spoken here recently? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, he was instrumental in, in kind of taking this object of object-orientedness, which comes from computer science, right, and connecting it with philosophy because um, the third name down on the list there, Graham Harmon, um, is putting forward a, a new set of uh, philosophical writings that um, is interested in looking at the world as a kind of vast array of objects. And so, um, again, this idea of object-oriented philosophy is something that, in his mind, is, is, a, is, a, is a very um, useful way to talk about this, this world of objects that he, that he sees. So anyway, there's a lot more we can say about that. But we'll stop there. And I think Frank. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, so, so I am going to uh, jump in here, and before we open it up to QA from everybody, um, I'm going to uh, ask a, a okay. few questions one-on-one uh, -on -one and kind of uh, interview. F first of all, um, I want to uh, thank you very much for, for an excellent talk, and, and I want to especially um, celebrate the, the way that you framed the question uh, of games uh, in this very broad sense and looking at the, the history of philosophy and uh, the relationship of games 
to uh, you know over the centuries to the kind of thinking and the kind yeah. of work that philosophy has done. Because uh, you could have easily come in here yeah. and talked about um, you know uh, philosophy and Super Mario World. You know what I mean? Like that—that yeah. that is that's a typical take. Uh, you know that you might expect. I'm sure there's a book out there yeah. that's like, oh, the philosophy of video games, and it's really sort of a, a pop philosophy uh, take uh, that uh, starts with um, starts with with games, uh, but really games as we know them now, yeah. which um, tend to be thought of almost predominantly as these little uh, single player uh, digital games. And you're looking at a much broader uh, uh, a much broader uh, uh, approach yeah. to the topic, which I which I think is exciting and, and good, um, and in fact, even um, last night we had uh, we had a, a there was a great talk uh, by Will Wright at the Games yeah. for Learning uh, Institute here at NYU, um, and uh, one of the things that that he um, put up as a slide uh, that bothered me a little bit was uh, he was comparing games to the uh, other uh, kinds of cultural forms and things like storytelling. So he had a yeah. slide, and in his slide there was like, uh, he had one image that was storytelling, it was like, uh, you know, cave people sitting around a fire, and then it evolves to the modern day, and he had a, a frame from Star Wars, uh -huh. right? And then over on games, he had like this very early computer, like the Univac, and then it evolves <laughs> into, you know, like a SimCity or, or some, you know, contemporary video game. Yeah. But in fact, what you're pointing out is that you could easily put the game up here, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. and show it evolving into the computer, yeah, right, yeah. and that's that is something that I, I find uh, very exciting that that uh, that that games have by by influencing the way that we think about the world as, as the way philosophers think about the world and the way scientists think about the world and and the way uh, people who think about the world think about the world um, helped <laughs> pr helped produce the computer and 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 then the computer goes on to produce the computer games yeah. um, but having said that i wonder do you think that there is something particular about the current moment and contemporary games and digital games and computer games yeah. and video games uh, that gives them a special status within this within these questions yeah yeah i think that's a good a good question um, you're you're absolutely right you know, I'm I'm in I'm invested in in a project that kind of looks at the deep history of games, um, you know, and also the deep history of computation, um, and so I think the answer to that is really about um, it's kind of the Conway's Game of Life thing, right? Like, how can we, uh, you know, where does it come from? This notion that um, we can have like a kind of field on which there are these actors and the actors are kind of autonomous they're making their own decisions right and they're interacting with each other and there's a lot of them so it's a complex system and things are unfolding in a nonlinear way not in a linear way mm -hmm. um, so that's um, you know that may not equal you know this is civilization game or something but but I think that it's a it's a it's a you know paradigm or something that um, needs to have a history, or, or that I think has a history, and, and I want to help tell that. So yeah. that's, that's, I think, the place where we are now. Yeah, I mean, it seems like yeah. one of the, the roots of, of these ideas is in the way that games uh, discretize the world, right? Yeah. That, they, yeah. that they separate things into, like, that's what the chessboard is about. Yeah. It's about, let's treat this smooth and continuous flow yeah. Yeah. as if it were divided up into discrete Quantities yeah. and these discrete quantities are in fact imaginary. There is no, uh, there, 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 you know, you can zoom into the edge between the black and white uh, yeah. square there forever, and there will always be this crinkly blur. Yeah. But but we can treat them as a conceptual uh, exercise, uh, as if they were these discrete things. And you see that all all across games. You see that in every game, e even in, in in a sport. Uh, or racing, so it's one thing to say, okay, well, uh, the chessboard or chess is kind of a, a digital game before yeah. computers. It was yeah. already digital because we could treat these pieces right. as logical units, yeah. and we could treat a move as if it were this discrete, uh, you know, quantized thing. Um, but even in sports, I think you see that, like a, a, a race is a way of taking something that's hard to measure mm. and then making it discrete. Well, one mm -hmm. player was uh, was arrived at the the the, uh, the finish line before the other one, mm -hmm. and then that player is the winner. And that process of, of of separating those two things is a kind of making it discrete. But but I wonder, ironically, in a weird way, if video games are less like that. I mean, is it? I don't I don't know if you 
Uh, you play contemporary video games. Do you do you, sure. do you have an Xbox? Do you play yeah, yeah. games? What, what's a what's a game that that you enjoy? That that you, that you have you playing a game recently? Anything? Well, I just use my Xbox to watch movies. I, I have to guiltily admit, I always I so so seldom. Uh, yeah. But I, 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 well, are you playing I, like I don't know, Mass Effect Two or Bioshock Two or that's any of on these my li- those are yeah, yeah those are like those are next on my list yeah, um, yeah yeah I mean I, I like what you said about about um, like assigning variables to you know a class or a race you know so in World of Warcraft or something like that, and I think that's right. Um, this idea of an of an of an atom mm-hmm. or, or, a, or a discrete entity, mm-hmm. right? And that's why I wanted to stress all the chess stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. I think it illustrates that really well about chopping things up into, into, these, into these, um, these atoms. Um, and then, you know, part of that is to say, like, okay, there's no central brain that's going to tell everybody what their behavior is, but that each atom or each element has its own kind of autonomous decision-making mm-hmm. based on these small little... Rules or things that have so. And do you think that's still present in in oh, yeah, Mass yeah, Effect yeah, 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 or yeah, yeah, Bioshock? Yeah, 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 that yeah, yeah, under the hood. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it looks like yeah. it's it's this fluid world, three D world about continuous yeah. movement and action and you yeah. know all of this. But really, under the hood, there's still a lot of the same stuff yeah. that you see in chess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, yeah, 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 and I, and I yeah, think that yeah. that's I think that's interesting. And you know, and, and just sorry to interrupt, but sure. the, you know, an object in an object oriented language is really not that different from a general kind of metaphorical sense. Then if you're playing, you know, Bioshock and you run into a room and there are like, you know, six NPCs or something. I mean, mm-hmm. those are, you know, objects that mm-hmm. may have sub-object qualities to them that are arranged in systems. So it's yeah. really that way of looking at the world that I'm interested in exploring. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, w- I also wanted to ask you uh, a, a kind of a big, broad question, like what is philosophy good for? What's the purpose of philosophy? I know you're not a philosopher, I'm not a philosopher. We're both people that are interested in philosophy uh, uh, and it's sort of tangentially, re- you, you, I think as a, as a full-time scholar and, and an author and, and a kind of media theorist um, are very closely related to the work of philosophers. Me, as a, as a game designer and a teacher, um, I, I mean, I observe it and I'm, I'm kind of on the outside of it looking in. Yeah. But what, like, what is the purpose of philosophy like? In a, in a well, large sense, or just for you personally? Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, philosophy is, um, for, for a lot of philosophers, it's about um, sort of clear thinking mm-hmm. and trying to think clearly and systematically through questions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, this notion that goes back to Socrates of, of philosophy as the love of wisdom, I also think is is quite powerful. Socrates was, was actually quite devout. Um, and he meant, when he, meant lo- when he said love wisdom, he meant literally, um, you know, love is a god. Um, so we have to have a kind of divine relationship to wisdom. Um, I personally am drawn to um, the continental tradition of philosophy, which has mm-hmm. a great um, kind of interest in critique, the concept of critique. Um, and so for me personally, that's probably what I'm, what I'm drawn to, the, the critical powers of, of philosophical thinking. <clears throat> I wanted to um, actually follow up on that a little bit because I, uh, you know, you understand, I mean, I, I understand that this, this division in, in the 20th century uh, between continental philosophy mm-hmm. and the structuralists and the post-structuralists and the post-modernists um, on the one hand, and uh, sort of analytical uh, philosophy, the sort of Anglo-American. This is like the sort of the great chasm. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and so on. The, yeah, the Anglo uh, uh, sort of analytical style coming more out of like the logical positivists and having yeah. a more rational and less kind of poetic and playful take. And yeah. in a weird way, they both have games. They both. Have a kind of stake in games. Yeah. So for the for the continentals, uh, games. There's a lot of game, just gaming, and and mm-hmm. and um, there is a playfulness. Uh, there is a focus on structure, mm-hmm. on system, um, on semiotics and rule systems, and it leads to a yeah. kind of uh, disruptive and perverse and playful approach mm-hmm. in the philosophy itself. I, in the analytical tradition, you get a lot of thought problems that are like yeah. little games. Right. You, you get more of the kind of game theory thing of like, 
like trolley problems, which are like right. little games. Like what would you do in this situation? Little ethical dilemmas or, uh, or Newcomb's paradox or uh, yeah. Searle's Chinese room. These, these things, yeah. they, they feel like little, little game problems. Um, it, does, does either one of these two uh, traditions, uh, are, are games, are they con a connection between these two, th these two uh, fields of, of philosophy or are they just using them in, in totally different ways? I mean, I wonder. Yeah, yeah, I think you, I think you put it really well. Um, uh, I mean, I can just maybe sort of, sure. sort of um, put it in my own words. Um, I, I, think, I think you're exactly right that in the, in the so-called continental tradition of philosophy, um, which I wouldn't say maybe is more political, but certainly is, is influenced very strongly by, um, or has been, by, by political concerns, you're right that play plays the role of almost a kind of escape valve or a sort of the thing that, you know, the powers that be can't pin down, right? It's the thing that we can always rely on. And that's, I think that's what, why Derrida's interested in it. It's why all those people are interested in it. Um, on the analytic side, you're right. Um, the analytic Anglo-American tradition in philosophy is um, probably more apt to do things like um, pose thought experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're right in, in saying that that is kind of like the, you know, proposing a sort of mini little game. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe we call that a model, mm -hmm. like making these sort of hypothetical models. Um, yeah. Do the two sides come together? Um, I don't know. It's, it's really one of those things that, um, you know, fighting like cats and dogs, you know. Um, but, uh, now I've, is, I've, I've, just let me finish. <coughs> sure, sure. The, 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 it's, it sounds silly, but at the end of the day, I almost think it's really about like, like, like you know, whether you drink wine or beer or something. I mean, it's, it's almost just like a style. <laughs> it's not necessarily about like real philosophical questions because the same questions are asked by the continental people and by the analytic people. So I love that. That's a great way to put yeah. it. Um, <laughs> and I, I like them both. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, so, uh, one of the, I mean, I, I just want to highlight one of the things you said about the purpose of philosophy and, and the role of philosophy, uh, the, the love of wisdom, um, and I think it's also, it seems to me like what you get when you think about thinking, yeah. right? It's what you get when, the, when you try to point the brain at itself, as if the brain were a camera, right, that, that yeah. tries to understand things and model things and... And if you point the brain at itself, um, you start thinking about thinking. What are the yeah. underlying structures of thought? And what is it that we can know and can't know? And what claims can we make about the world? Um, and games, as, an, as a cultural form, as an aesthetic form, <clears throat> feel very much the same way to me. Yeah. They feel like a way of making thought and decision making present mm -hmm. to our senses. Mm -hmm. Like we, 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 we first hear about Sudoku, <clears throat> and then we, we get a Sudoku and we like, what is this? And then we start filling it out and then, and then we start like making up little heuristics and rules of thumb. Oh, I see, if you do this, you can always do that. And you can, for the, like this thing that's always going on, you get a little picture of it for the first time. Yeah. Oh, I'm making up these little rules and then I'm chunking them into yeah. smaller, into, into, like, collapsing them into sets. Until now I'm not even thinking about those first rules because they're intuitive mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm coming up with these larger rules and you feel yourself like, you feel your brain wrapping itself around this problem, which yeah. is something that's constantly happening, but we're never aware of it. Um, so in that sense, I think games and philosophy are, are, are like deeply, yeah. deeply related. Yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe that's why mm. learning and play are so closely connected mm -hmm. for, the, for the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's the famous saying, um, you were talking about self-reflection. Yeah. The same, you know, the famous um, dictum around, uh, you know, know thyself, yeah. right? Um, from the Greek tradition. But if somebody like Socrates would be the first person to say that if you were to kind of do that on steroids, right, if you were to sort of yeah. do that over and over again, you would collapse into a kind of, um, you know, hyper-technical, like, mental, rational psychosis or yeah. something, right? And there's a name for that. That's what the sophists do. You know, they are the pure yeah. technicians of, of speech and rhetoric, and, you know, that's just as bad as saying that you want to try to know yourself, right? right. Games, I think, is, is, is directly connected because in a, in a game or in a game environment, 
yeah, you have to think. You have to have a, a kind of mental projection or arrangement of the rules or something like that. But then you have to do something. <laughs> you, yeah. know, you have to act. You have to play. Yeah. And, and that, that sort of toggle between kind of thinking and doing, I think, is crucial. Hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and I guess one of the ways that philosophy has been understood uh, traditionally is as the place where we ask the question, what is a good life? Yeah. Right. I don't know who's a Plato or somebody, Socrates or somebody, was like, that's basically the big question. <laughs> how should I live? How should we live our lives? How should one live a life? Like, yeah. what should should you sit in contemplation? Should you get married and have children? Should you become rich and famous? Should you devote your life? Like, these are the, these are the big philosophical questions. And so that that's interesting to me. And leveling up, maybe. I don't. Yeah, but it's weird because, on the one hand, I want to keep games as an aesthetic form, separate from the world, never mm, about yeah, practical, yeah, yeah. You know, just like Hosinga yeah. and, and Kyle Watt, you know, this separate domain in which we do things for their own sake. Yeah. And, 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 and in a way, philosophy can be seen in the same way. Like philosophy is where we, wisdom for its own sake, understanding the world is a value in and of itself. And in that sense, games of philosophy are related. But then you can also yeah. say, well, yeah, but you sit around thinking and then eventually you invent the computer and the entire world changes <laughs> yeah. you know, for the better, let's yeah. hope, but like you transform the world in a very concrete way. That yeah. is doing, you know, that is not just, you know, thinking about thought for its own sake, that is utterly transforming the world in a very material yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's kind of a weird dilemma. I don't know <laughs> which of this, I kind of, I, I want to preserve this, this, this hermetic, you know, thing. Yeah. Um, and yet, yeah, you, you end up doing. Um, and, and sort of like, so related to that, let me, let me push a little bit more on the, the relationship of philosophy to aesthetics. So you brought up this idea of, of, uh, of art and, and yeah. art practice yeah. and its relationship to, to conceptual questions. And, and, um, and I guess my question is really, do you think the relationship of games to philosophy is very analogous, very close to the relationship of other aesthetic forms to philosophy. Mm -hmm. Things like painting and literature and poetry and, and drama. Or does it have a special status that's different? Gosh, that's a tough question. I mean, um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe the answer is wow, they're not, not that. I, I don't know if I have any sense of that. Um, I mean, yeah, I let, I me, mean let me, let me, let me, let me ask it this way, like there's, there's a, um, you know, I mean, I think of, of games as an aesthetic form, and so for me, they, yeah, they yeah. seem very similar to these other things, but is that, does but that you're make right, sense like in the to tradition, you? games have kind of been left out as a sort of yeah. aesthetic achievement or something, yeah, so. So maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's a, maybe that's a curveball, and maybe that's a yeah. way in which they're kind of not like those other things. Yeah, I mean, maybe it is this legacy of kind of, Oh, it's what, what, what kids do or something, you know. It's yeah. not at the level of poetry or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems to be related to um, uh, this, this question of, of, well, these other things are usually understood as more representational, right? Right. Whereas games are not. Games are maybe right. a little bit closer to music. Or theater. Or, or theater. Yeah. Uh, but even, you know, even yeah. in theater, you, you clearly have you know, things like painting and literature can be seen as philosophical in the way that they're kind of making claims about the world by making these these little uh, representations of the world. Yeah. Like, oh, this is how a person betrays another person. This is how you suffer if you do this and such a thing. Or yeah. these are how these relationships play out among humans. Um, and um, in in games, you have uh, you know you have a kind of slippery yeah. uh, relationship to representation, because they have this representational surface, and then under the hood, they're like these cellular automata, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, the Olympics are on right now. Maybe we think about sport as the way in which play gets aestheticized as you know the beauty of bodies mm -hmm. moving through space and and so on. Yeah. Because um, I think that we could we could definitely talk about. A, a, a way in which sport is valued aesthetically, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe in a way that playing chess isn't, or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I, one more, maybe one more little uh, uh, line of questioning. Then I'm going to open it up to to everybody for for a, a Q and A. Um, but I want to 
ask a little bit more about DeBoard. So I know you have a you you have this project that you've done. You can talk about DeBoard all day long. Yeah, I know that you you, you um, created a uh, you helped create a, a, a computer version of the Game yeah. of War. Um, you studied it in depth, um, and uh, it. I guess my my real question is, how is the Game of War related to DeBoard's philosophy, oh, like yeah. okay. his his conceptual approach? Uh, it, because I, I don't understand quite like how the two are related to each other. Yeah, good question. Okay, yeah. so this is this is a, this is a great question, and I think it's it's good because I, I I think I know the answer. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so if you if you know you know the first image that's usually shown when you talk about the Situationist or something is an image that is either this image or one that's a lot like it, which is um, the so-called Naked City map that De Boord made in the late 1950s, which was a, a kind of photo collage of of the of a city. Um, but you know those of you who study graph theory, you know that this is a graph, right? This is not a map. This is nodes connected by links. Um, this is a topological space. So it's very progressive in that sense. Um, quite interesting. Now, the game of war is extremely rigid. Um, it's almost like an anti-situationist project. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's basically in a nutshell the answer to your question. I, I call it, um, you know, I, I, I like, I, I've called this game um, a, a nostalgic project that De Boord engages in because it's nostalgic basically for an older model of warfare in particular, Napoleonic campaign warfare that's highly routinized and based on really specific treaties. You know, you meet on a field and there's two opposing armies that are similarly equipped, and so on. Um, so I think of this as a kind of throwback game because of the fact that it's so rigid. And, and, and th th what you're seeing here is my attempt to actually diagram some of the game relations for a, one specific game, um, for one specific turn, one specific game. And, and hopefully you can see how dramatically different this representation is. It's, it's a scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. It's a crystalline shape mm -hmm. from this, which is a topological graph and a network. Um, yeah. But, the, but, but so, so the, the relationship is that they're opposites? Yeah, I feel I mean, like is he, he escaping? For, is he like <laughs> renouncing the work he did? Well, and and, 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 and let, me, let me cut right to the chase too because we think of DeBoer, I think of DeBoer as a, as, as a critic of power structures, right? He's a revolutionary in the yep. sense of wanting yep. to question yep. these top-down power structures and he's an important voice for the counterculture movements and and, and then he goes and he's like, he's, he's playing with toy soldiers and he's like fantasizing yeah. about war. Yeah. So yeah. What, what gives there? Well, what? Mackenzie Work called this um, DeBoard's retirement project. Um, <laughs> another friend of mine calls this, he, he likes to say that, that DeBoard is, um, was, um, was abrasively anachronistic, mm -hmm. meaning that you know, whatever you thought he was going to do based on consistency with what he did before, he would just do something completely different or something. And, you know, maybe there's, that's something to be said here. Um, there is, however, maybe a really, really simple answer to that question, which is that um, de Boer was a, was a militant. He was a political militant, or at least he thought of himself in that way. And so he was obsessed with um, strategy. And I think it's very reasonable to, to, to say that he thought of this game as basically a strategy learning, a way to learn strategy, or a way to teach strategy to people. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. And there's, there's, there's proof, or there's evidence for this position in his writings where he, you know, he makes, maybe a little tongue-in-cheek, but he makes, um, uh, he makes references to how like, the, the cavalry pieces on the game board are like, you know, the members of the Situationist International as they, you know, unfold and march across the, you know, the great landscape of the city or something like that, right? So, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, he liked um, strategy. He liked learning uh, about the history of of uh, military theory. He was obsessed with Napoleon, which again is you would not expect that, but he was ex he was really obsessed with the 
the heroics of Napoleon. He was obsessed with the kind of monumentality of it. Mm. So he's a, he's yeah. a weird figure. He doesn't fall <clears throat> into a typical sense of like, you know, a touchy-feely liberal or something, because he wasn't it, that it, at all. Um, <laughs> it does make me think a little bit of the idea of the exteriority of the war machine, which is this idea from Deleuze and, and Guattari, in which they talk about yeah. the real power structure is over here, but the, you have the judge and the priest, and these are the guys that are in the city keeping it locked down. And then over here you've got the warlord, yeah. and he's kind of outside, and he's like a nasty figure, but basically they rent him out to do their dirty work, right. but he's flo a free-floating right, 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 thing, right, 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 and he right. can be appropriated for, for revolutionary purposes, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and they were also, I think, into that. And that, that sounds like that there is this weird outside yeah. uh, of, of strategy and, and war and, and, and maybe games. And yeah. maybe that's a, a good way to, to think about games as, as this little outside force. Yeah. Um, so let's open it up to some Q&A from the audience. Do people have questions? And we have a microphone that we can. So let's bring the mic down and, and uh, give it out people. Yes. Nope, nope. Uh, Frank, you mentioned the relationship between uh, games and aesthetics and how they, they fit into the uh, philosophical heritage there. And I was wondering if you think that um, the postmodernists like Derrida or Baudrillard might put them closer to language in terms of a sort of a philosophical construct for understanding the world. Uh, you know, discrete game states as representative of the world. And in fact, that is the world that we know. Yeah, I think that's right. That, that um, and, and it maybe didn't come out in the, in the, in the quotes I read, but, um, but yeah, play is a kind of, is connected, directly connected to language. And so the, the linguistic the play kind of within linguistic systems, that's, yeah, that's like the mother load for Derrida, yeah. I'm also interested, you mentioned the, the, the guys who are moving past this, um, moving past postmodernism. Um, I'm wondering if they're, yeah, if they're right. looking at the world as more of a, yeah, exactly, the speculative realism, if they're looking at the world as more of a continuous space or, or even one that we can understand, how does that relate to games then, if games are you know, previously in postmodernism, games are this construct with which we, we can right. understand the world. If now we can understand the world on its own, what is the, how does a game relate to the world now? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, like what you said about a construct, um, because this, this, this new realism movement is, would be interested in, you know, kind of piercing through those constructs and saying, no, we can, we can actually make direct claims about the real world. Um, but you can have an artificial construct that looks like a cellular space or following, you know, Deleuze or Whitehead or other, you know, Leibniz, Spinoza. Um, you can also have a direct, you know, kind of realist definition of the world that looks like a game space. Um, so that's why I tried to give a little bit of that, of that lineage. Um, so I don't think that... that you know, one or the other would, would um, make it impossible to think about the world as a game space. Yeah. Sure. And, I, and I do think it's interesting to, to your, your point about games and their similarity to languages. Uh, even as an aesthetic form, it's really interesting to me because when you think about these mm. things that are cultural works, but that are like languages. They're rules. Yeah, right? They're so you have a cultural work that's like a beautiful vase, right? It's mm. an object that sits on a table and it's so much easier to understand as an art object than when I design something that's basically a cultural practice, like a yeah. language. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what Sudoku is, is like. It's like a little tiny language, and it's what a lot of games are like. Um, and so in that sense, games are also, I think, demand a change in our approach to the philosophy of art, right? To how we approach things, how we approach aesthetic objects, and how we think about aesthetic works. Yeah. Um, there was a question back in the yell. Did you have a question? Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, just interesting about the idea of games as a magic circle where anything can necessarily happen. But when you have um, games like MMORPGs where there's necessarily no beginning, no end, how would that philosophy be applied to those kind of situations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
And there's probably different gradations, you know. Uh, you know, kind of like pervasive gaming will definitely make that very difficult to tell, you know, whether you're in it or not in it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like, if you play WoW or something, you're still, you're still going into the magic circle, right? Um, but I think maybe, yeah, you're right. There's a, there's a tendency for this to become more pervasive. Um, casual gaming as well kind of breaks down that hard and fast distinction. Um, well, Alex, what yeah. is your take on the question of the status of something like a gold piece in, in WoW? So there's an argument about, uh, you know, there's pe people like uh, Ed Edward Castronova and, and the Terra Nova crowd, and, and some, of the, some of the things that they talk about are the way that, well, all currency is fictional, yeah. so there's no difference between a gold piece in yeah, WoW yeah, and, a, and a dollar. What's your take on that question? It's kind of a philosophical question. Yeah, what do, you, yeah, um, do you agree with that? You know, money money is a social convention. Um, I mean, it's rooted in, or at least rooted historically in, you know, things that have value like gold pieces and, and things like that. But no, I think that today, in this day and age, money is a, a kind of social, implicit social contract. So it doesn't surprise me at all that things are valued in virtual spaces. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> Other uh, questions? Um, why don't we go to the back, right behind you, and then we'll bring it up front. I was wondering if you could speak briefly about the notion of like, gaming, gaming the system, and maybe, uh, because it seems mm. like concerned with uh, rule breaking or bending, or, or not necessarily cheating, but I mean, um, and where you might place the inklings of this idea in the historical record of uh, philosophy. Yeah, wow, good question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I have any you know, anything up my sleeve on that one. And uh, doing like a deep historical project on cheating would be really, really interesting. Um, what about exploit? Is that is that one of the topics of that oh, book? Oh, okay, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, so there's this idea maybe around, um, so going back to what we said a minute ago around uh, this notion of, of play as being that escape valve that you can always rely on within, you know, rigid systems. Um, which is sometimes associated with the post-structuralist tradition in philosophy. Um, so this idea of an exploit just comes out of, you know, the parlance of computer coders and, you know, is there a bug that you can exploit in a piece of software? And so maybe that would be the way to think about this idea of gaming the system, that, that in any kind of, like, formal structure, um, I guess if you subscribe to this way of thinking, in any kind of complex apparatus, there's always going to be little inroads that you can take advantage of where things are either outright broken or just based on the complexity of design, you know, it opens up weird little eddies that you can move into or something. So that would be maybe how I would approach this idea of gaming the system. But cheating might be slightly different. And I, I'm not sure I know enough about that, but it's, it's a really interesting hmm. concept. Um, hmm. I'm not saying I'm not a cheater, uh, but. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to pass the mic forward? Thank you. Hi. Uh, so uh, when, I, when I think about the uh, trying to kind of square games as an artistic medium uh, with the rest of what we consider the purview of aesthetics and, and art. Um, I, I actually, I, I, I found it useful that you brought up uh, like the simulation-based kind of approach to um, export, uh, science, as it were, the, new, yeah. the proposed you know, so-called new kind of science, which I guess pits mm. this concept of uh, a simulation of a system um, against the traditional method of, of formulation of a system. Mm -hmm. right? Right. So um, on the one hand, you have this sort of analytical approach, which is something like uh, a reduction of existing knowledge down to uh, more compact uh, representations, which can then be easily um, sort of transmitted socially. And so yeah. we, can, we, we get these sort of um, shortcuts uh, via the work done by other people mm -hmm. um, versus uh, something that's more uh, exploratory in nature. And so, so yeah. on the one hand, you have, you know, with traditional art, we think of primarily in terms of like authorship. Right, in terms of authorial intent and things like that. I have a message that I want to convey to you, and I do it by packaging it in this certain way that is like getting across this whole like lifetime of ideas into a, into a, in a, a little pill that you can take, and then it expands, and you kind of 
get to retrace my steps. Whereas with the game, it's like we sort of posit a bunch of stipulations, right? Mm -hmm. We like we set we we set some boundary conditions, like 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 you said, you know, we we, we sort of uh, just we discretize everything and we create these we stipulate these relationships and then we see what happens. Uh, and in the process, um, we learn about a lot about you know, our our process of navigating uh, the, the landscape, but we don't necessarily uh, learn anything about the world mm -hmm. per se. Um, but of course, mm -hmm. these abstract methods that we develop in, in, in figuring these system out, systems out can often uh, have parallels elsewhere. Um, and so the idea of language being a game in this respect is, is, is especially interesting because unlike other games, it, it, it doesn't have this, uh, it, it's not inherently thought of as not being related to the world, but rather quite the opposite. And and it's almost like uh, it's it's like okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say chair, right? You're gonna agree. Let's agree, chair. Okay. And uh, and it's almost like we need this as a scaffold for a, a systematized exploration, so that the form, form stage of a formulation can happen later. So I I, I don't know. I've, I've always felt conflicted. I think maybe treating sorry <laughs> uh, treat, treating games as, as separate from art was always something I was mm. more averse to but I think on a certain level there's there's two very deeply different processes going on but which are somehow functionally related to each other I mean, that could be yeah possible. yeah and no, I like what you said about um, this difference between um, describing something using a formula versus describing something using like a simulation of it or a model of it or something and that's in my mind, those are two really different traditions. Um, I mean, they're different in science, as you mentioned. You know, so the, the so you can think about a formula like you know the law of gravity mm -hmm. or e equals m c squared or something, right? Like that describes natural phenomena. But if you want to describe a complex thing like turbulence in a cloud or in you know laminar forces in the way air moves or something, <coughs> a nonlinear system. Those kinds of laws don't work very well. And so historically, um, you know, uh, moving toward this kind of parallel processing cellular model system type approach, um, simulated system type approach, seems to be a lot easier, you know, to, to be an easier way to be able to, you know, scientifically describe and Reproduce these kinds of complex systems that are that are, as I said, nonlinear, um, and uh, you know, a, a model that has entities with variables and behaviors. I think that's kind of maybe how you put it. That's kind of what a game is. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that, again, that's why I'm trying to marry that tradition with the, the tradition of gaming. But I, I, it's interesting you say that because I, I guess I see the limits of cellular automata based exploration to be similar to the limits of what a game can teach us, which is to say um, it's based on a set of stipulations at the end of the day and the degree to which it mimics reality can be, you know, mm. uh, yeah. adjusted, but, but often, yeah. oftentimes it, it, because it's this finite state system, right. It's never, it, I mean, not that reality isn't necessarily one, but it's never going to be the level of sort of complexity of, of reality. Right. Like it's, it's not rich level. enough so, or something. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So, yeah. so at the end of the day, it's like it can tell you a lot about the structure uh, or, or certain structural phenomena, but maybe not. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like, yeah. Kind of begs the question. Yeah. Um, is there another? You want to just pass it right to this gentleman in the. So, so we'll, do, we'll do you, and then we'll do one more question. Okay. So uh, is, the, is the game. Uh, in life or outside life, because you, uh, I mean, the tradition speaks of uh, uh, the make-believe, the second reality, the free and reality that play transpires outside everyday life, and then we have a real life as game space. We have social games, this sort of convergence or leaking out, as it were. So um, yeah. this thing came up before as well through the discussion. What is your response to that? Uh. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a kind of paradox. Um, it, maybe we can go back to that, you know, loosery attitude thing, um, which is that, you know, I think when you're playing, well, first of all, I, do, I believe that there's just one world, right? We're, we're all in one world, and that's where we are. But maybe when you're playing, maybe something's just a little different, right? There's an attitude shift or a 
aspect shift or right it's just a little little kind of accent or something that differentiates it maybe just temporarily yeah but the two sides are always mm -hmm. you know you can you can bring somebody out of play and say that the phone is ringing or something right yeah um, one more question eric might want to uh, eric let's do it pass the mic to the z man <laughs> Uh, if I were to sort of play dumb for a second, I would say that the question of why games hadn't been considered among the great art forms is simple. It's just because they weren't really authored for century, for millennia mm. and centuries, right? In the same way that 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 great works of art and, and music and theater had authors, mm. um, and so there and so for whatever cultural and economic reasons, um, there wasn't anything invested mm. in the notion of game geniuses in terms of the creation of games as works. Um, obviously, I, you know, I'm a game designer, so I'm not saying that that's the proper way of considering games. I'm just saying that maybe that's why mm -hmm. it evolved that way. But it strikes me that, um, again, on, on just a very simple basic level, if, if um, aesthetics are about beauty, um, it does seem to me that we're living in a, in a, in a, in a society now in which if, if there's any new sort of beauty and appreciation, not necessarily among philosophers or aesthetes, but really just among um, uh, less professional uh, uh, devotees of, of aesthetics, an interest in the beauty of systems, right? So that the commuter yeah. trying to get to work uh, ha you know, understands that there's a beauty in a well-functioning system down to whether the signage is good, telling you when a train is going to arrive, or if it's not going to arrive, what the alternate route is—is is there a, um, uh, is there a, uh, a, there's a beauty in like people now are becoming, uh, you know, uh, uh, connoisseurs of a well-designed interface for an, for an ATM, right? Because it's just something that they have to interact with on a daily basis. So I wonder if, with all of that in mind, despite the fact that games may not have been considered. Uh, you know, great art or, or beautiful, are we, are we moving into a time when there is a need or an interest or it may be just a groundswell from the bottom up rather than from the academy when people mm -hmm. will start considering the beauty of systems as a, as a, it, within a pantheon of, of, of art or aesthetics? Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's well put. The first part you said about um, no kind of no tradition of, of the author or something I think is really interesting and it made me think of the notion of, of a game as a kind of folk practice mm -hmm. a kind of folk art for you know mm -hmm. a lot of our history um, and uh, and I think you're also right about this idea of, of sort of um, people learning and, and and cultivating a kind of aesthetic design sense or something and there, I think the, the tradition there is maybe one about craft and um, finesse and style, um, right? The, a job well done. So th I think there is a tradition within our lives of kind of, you know, how you enact a behavior in an elegant or beautiful way. And I think that's will be the seeds of this, this, this and aesthetic. Then, and then uh, games are the aesthetic form of systems, right? But, I mean, but I, also, I also think it's really powerful to think of games as, as folk philosophy. Yeah. Right? We were talking about what's philosophy good for, and it's thinking about thinking of it. It's not just something that professionals do. It's not just something that philosophers do. Yeah. Um, and in a way, games are a folk philosophy about determinism and free will, about uh, fate yeah. and randomness, about merit and reward, about mm -hmm. thought and action. So when you go to the casino or when you play games with your friends when you do that you're thinking about thinking in this way that is not you know which is which is philosophical in a, in, in some in some sense yeah so it's yeah. kind of that's kind of a powerful uh, idea um, I think we're gonna wrap it up All right. uh, thank you very much Alex Galloway and um, and thank you all for, for coming. Uh, next month, we're going to have a panel on uh, games journalism. We're going to have uh, Lee Alexander and Jamin Brophy Warren and Stephen Totillo. So that'll be next month.